You got a problem with bouncing Bettys? Step off. I'm Torn Atkinson. Butterfly Minds, fun for all ages. I'm Joe Fulgham. Go out of bounds on this golf course and you'll end up with a huge handicap. I'm Kevin Leeson, and this is Caustic Sun. Word origin. Mm-hmm. The name Bind originates from the ancient practice of military mining, where tunnels were dug under enemy fortifications or troop formations by sappers. Oh. Mm. These killing tunnels, a.k.a. mines, were at first collapsed to destroy targets located above, but they were later filled with explosives and detonated in order to cause even greater devastation. Okay. Mm. From Old French mine, which means vein, load, tunnel, shaft, mineral, ore for coal, tin, et cetera, of uncertain origin. You know, our our, mm-hmm. our mutual friend Jordan Pratt, uh-huh. he wanted to remind us that uh, uh, our friend Kenny B, his uh, father, you don't, know, you don't know Kenny B. It's I know okay. Kenny G. But uh, Joe is there, and I. Is there oh, a yeah. different Kenny of the alphabet because for every letter of the alphabet? There is. Well, there's Kenny A, there's Kenny B, there's Kenny C, there's Kenny D. And I think Kenny B is now Kenny F, actually, but... Oh, Our old friend Kenny, Kenny fuck F. It. Kenny, fuck it. Uh, his father spent a few years diffusing landmines in Vietnam or Cambodia. Really? Mm. And he is what is known as a sapper, which Mil- which uh, which comes from the British and or, mil- military engineers that would dig listening tunnels under German lines in World War One. Did Kenny B's dad actually do that, or was he just deaf using landmines? Oh, yeah, he was using like, landmines. Definitely he was, using he's, he's landmines. Deaf. Oh, he's deaf, deaf after using... all the explosions blew out his ears. Oh, yeah, there you go. He's a yeah. deaf man using landmines. And they would rig these tunnels and uh, other vaults with explosives and booby traps to sap, sap the mm-hmm. enemy's strength. Yep. Mm-hmm. Later, these units would utilize would be utilized to clear captured or contested areas of landmines or booby traps. So if you ever see a bumper sticker or a, a sign that says, follow the sapper, it means follow the guy who's clearing a path through the minefield. Okay. Mm-hmm. Ekrixophobia, from Greek ekrixi, is the fear of explosions. Right. It's kind of an onomatopoeia, too. Ekrixi. Landmines. <laughs> and sea mines. Oh. And space mines. We'll be talking about all of those mines. Yeah. Space mines. I don't think we have enough to do a whole space mines episode. Not yet. There's time. There's time yet. Get on it, uh, Evil Empire, whichever one we're talking about these <laughs> Space days. is so big and mines are so small, though. They are. Let's just go around. I just think you got to make them planet-sized. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanks to our researcher and helper, Juwan, for a bunch of this information. <laughs> a landmine is an explosive device concealed under or on the ground and designed to destroy or disable enemy combatants or vehicles as they pass over or near it. Right. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Such a device is typically detonated automatically by way of pressure when a target steps on it or drives over it, yep. though other detonation mechanisms are also sometimes used. A land mine may cause damage by direct blast effect. Okay. That's probably the most common. By fragments that are thrown by the blast. Yep. All right. Or, Those are, can do lots of damage. Or both. Mm-hmm. Though many types of improvised explosive devices, IEDs, can technically be classified as landmines, the term landmine is typically reserved by manufactured for manufactured devices designed to be used by recognized military services, right. whereas IED is used for makeshift devices assembled by paramilitary insurgent or terrorist groups. So we'll not be really talking about IEDs mm-hmm. in okay. this episode. Um, because you're against birth control. Yes. Right. We want to explode want, those uteri. <laughs> we want those those uteri to blow up. Yeah, Improvised right. uterine devices. Yeah, that's what that's what your hand is. I think, yeah. Kevin. Mm-hmm. The use of landmines is controversial because of their power, because of their potential as indiscriminate weapons. They can remain dangerous many years after a conflict has ended, harming the economy and civilians of many developing nations. Call back to our special blend with Adam Pateman. Yes, uh, who was you know had uh, in West Africa when he's doing a safari bus tour and there was a uh, a part of the desert that evidently was littered with landmines yes. from some conflict uh, 
in and around Ivory Coast and Sierra Leone. With pressure from a number of campaign groups organized through the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, which mm-hmm. I think is our charity of the week. Oh, yep. yeah, definitely. Let's do that. A Go global to uh, causedicksodapodcast.com and check that out. A global movement to prohibit their use led to the 1997 Convention on the Prohibition of the Use, Stockpiling, Production, and Transfer of Anti-Personnel Mines and on their destruction. Right. A naval mine... That's the one I find in my belly button. Is a self-contained explosive device placed in water. My belly button. To damage or destroy service ships or submarines. From my belly button. Unlike depth charges. Mm. From your butt. Mm. Mines oh. are deposited and left to wait until they are t- triggered by the approach of or contact with an enemy vessel. Naval mines can be used offensively to hamper enemy ships' movements or just, to lock vessels into a harbor. Well, I would also say racial epithets, right? You know, they're offensive. Uh, yes, or mm-hmm. defensively oh, to that's... protect friendly vessels and create safe zones. And mm-hmm. honk their horn. Mm-hmm. You, know. you guys ready for a pop quiz? All sure. right. How many landmines in uh, is our... How many landlines? Landlines? Zero. Interesting. Zero. Nobody has landlines anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They're, they're, they are extinct. Ridiculous. Unlike landmines. How many landmines are in the ground on the planet Earth right now. Oh, wow. Uh, can we get within, how, ma- how many do we need to get within? Like a million? Uh, you need to get exactly the number. Oh, exactly okay. the number. Uh, uh, 6,972,105. You're saying six, 6 million and change. Ah, uh, wow. That's almost 7 million, actually. 6, so you're saying like basically one for every thousand people, because like, there's like yeah. about 7 billion yeah, people. Something like so you're that. saying about, yeah. I'll go lower, I'll say about 2 million. 110 million. Wow! Is the estimate in the wow. ground. Whoa. And an equal amount is in stockpiles waiting to be planted or destroyed. Got it. Can we make those destroyed? Can yep. that be the option, yes. please? Yes, we can. So 220 million landmines are out there, either already in the field yeah. mm-hmm. or waiting to be put in the field. What does UXO stand for? Uh, underground extreme offensive weapon. I think I know. Is it unexploded object? Unexploded ordnance. Ordnance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Close. Other names are UXB, unexploded bomb, or okay. explosive remnants of war, ERW. Okay. These can be bombs, shells, grenades, landmines, naval mines, cluster munitions, etc. that did not explode when they were employed and still pose a risk of detonation. Got it. Mm-hmm. Potentially many decades after. Yeah, I mean, they're all like, you know, a lot of them are made of pretty sturdy stuff, yep. right? How long does the UN estimate it will take to clear all the landmines in the world with current technology? Well, with 110 million of them. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I did read an article not too long ago about a rat that can sniff out uh, landmines. Oh, we'll get to we, that. We talked about that in our rats episode. There are, there are, there are lots of rats in the world. Um, so all we have to do is let all the rats free. Mm. And boom, they will all just go to a landmine, so, sniff, sniff. How, how long does that take? Uh, we got to train the sewer rats. <laughs> yes. right? You got to capture then train sewer rats. Uh, uh, hundred and ten. I'm going to go with a hundred and ten million years. Hundred and ten million years. That's what he says. <laughs> uh, uh, hundred and fifty years. One thousand one hundred years. Wow. There you go. Yeah, I was close. And the cost. I had the I had the one one zero part. Yeah, and the cost of removing the, the mines would be fifty to one hundred billion dollars. So, yeah, those so those rats like, need a lot of cheese. One hundred ten million, fifty billion low end. Mm-hmm. So that's what's the math on there? That's five hundred dollars each to remove. Oh, very good. Something like that. Yeah, I think I think we're going to get to that. What is a Hertz horn? It's the horn that has like you know thumbtacks in the mouthpiece. <laughs> Play or die. Play the right. Hertz horn. Yeah. Oh, it hurts. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's uh, all the point. Hmm. Hertz. Well, I'm guessing it's spelled H E R T Z. That is correct. So okay. obviously, it's the thing that tells you that you honk when you drive a rental car. Oh, mm-hmm. from Hertz. Got rental it. Car. Got it. That's right. Yeah. These are these spiky protrusions on a naval mine. Okay. Mm. These, these are lead horns which contain a small glass ampulla full of electrolyte and two electrodes. When a ship runs into a mine, the soft lead of the horn will bend, breaking the ampulla and letting the electrolyte run into the horn. It will then 
close an electrical circuit, which detonates the mine. So kind of like those uh, glow sticks you can get, where they've got right. the little glass inside, and then you mm. kind of bend it, and it breaks, and that makes everything mix, and yeah, yeah. reaction yeah. happens. Except that the reaction is, is explosion. Ka- is a big kaboom. Mm-hmm. There was supposed to be an earth-shattering kaboom. Mm-hmm. What is the famous quote by Rear Admiral David Farragut referring to a naval minefield laid at Mobile, Alabama during the American Civil War? Damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead? That is the one. Wow. In the 19th century, mines were called torpedoes. Oh, I Got did. I, that's the only naval quote I could think of. A name probably conferred by Dennis Fletcher after the torpedo fish, known today as the electric ray. <laughs> oh. Which gives powerful electric shocks. Got it. A spar torpedo was a mine attached to a long pole and detonated with uh, when the ship carrying it rammed another one and withdrew to safe distance. Yeah, Mm -hmm. except for the fact that like lots of those ships would also get like sunk or blown up by like their own blast. It was really bad to get close to explosions. Yeah, well, when you stick a giant bomb on the end of a stick, (laughs) yeah, and then like just go full full speed ahead. They wanted to to do naval jousting, and that's the only way they could do it. That, as discussed in our submarines episode. You got it. So that's a spar torpedo. A Harvey torpedo was a type of floating mine towed alongside a ship and was briefly in service in the Royal Navy in the 1870s. Hmm. Other torpedoes attached to ships or propelled themselves. One such weapon, the Whitehead torpedo, caused the word torpedo to be used uh, for self-propelled underwater missiles as well as static devices. These mobile devices were also known as fish torpedoes. So a mine was a torpedo... A moving mine was a was fish, a fish torpedo. torpedo. Okay. Okay, I got it. And now we've simplified it Naval to... Naval mine and torpedo. And torpedo. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It is nice that we call two different things two different things instead of two it very is. similar things. The English language is a complete mess. What is an influence mine? Oh, well, there's two types of influence mines. There's the bad influence mine and the good influence mine. <laughs> yeah. And my mother always told me to you know, avoid the bad influence mines. So those are the ones... And hang out behind school, smoking cigarettes, and uh, drop it out of class. That is what the Koch brothers are leaving strewn about the American political system. Influence mines? Influence mines. As opposed to a contact mine, these naval mines are triggered by the influence of a ship or submarine. Such mines incorporate electronic sensors designed to detect the presence of a vessel and detonate when it comes within the blast range. Okay, okay. yeah. All right. The fuses of such mines may incorporate one or more of the following sensors. Magnetic. Mm-hmm. Passive acoustic or water pressure displacement caused by the proximity of a vessel. Got it. Mm-hmm. Influence. So mine. you don't need to hit the mine directly right. to get the explosion. Yeah. You just need to come close. If you are on an Avenger class mine countermeasure ship, MCM. Avenger okay. class. Uh, minesweeper, basically. Okay. All right. An Avenger class, though. Yeah, that's right. So, so it's, Tony Stark is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the first Avenger class. It's Iron Man, Captain America. The Hulk. Thor. Uh, you would notice red round stickers on televisions, laptops, and video game consoles. Mm-hmm. Why? Uh, uh, you'd see the... Say it again? On a MCM, Mine yeah. Countermeasure Ship. The, the Avenger, yeah. yeah the you would class. notice red round stickers. Red round stickers. Okay. On televisions, laptops, and video game consoles. Oh, oh. Uh, because they give off uh, EM radiation that could inter- interfere with the sensors that are finding mines? Close. Okay. Oh, no, it's like, uh, you know, you need to remember to turn them off so that you don't set off mines. Close. Even uh-huh. closer. Uh-huh. The MCM crew who drive actual wooden ships with hulls coated in fiberglass are very sensitive about anything that gives off any type of magnetic signature uh-huh. that's not essential to the operation of the ship. Right. Right. The event- they don't want to get blown up. The- People on Minesweepers <laughs> like to not get blown up. Up. Yes, that's right. You know, that's Minesweeper Duty 101. Don't get blown up. In the event that the MCM ship accidentally finds itself in a minefield, the stray electronics marked by a red dot are tossed overboard to reduce the ship's magnetic signature. Wow. wow. I so get it. These are the, these, these are the uh, disposable items. That yes. is better right. safe than sorry. I get it, yeah. though. I mean, mm-hmm. really, when the alternative is risking a sea mine exploding your wooden vessel. Yeah. yeah. The procedure for degaussing the larger steel warships mm-hmm. involves coils wound in, in specific locations of the hull, and the process takes almost a week. The term for erasing a ship's magnetism is called is deperming. Say it with me. Deperming. De-perming. And it gets, gets in, all the frizzies out. In yeah. <laughs> reference to the, uh, the oh-so-popular hairdo. Now we play the game. Ooh. Mm. How many landmines in the country? Okay. All right. 
Oh, okay. I thought it was going to be now we play the game Minesweeper on uh, Windows. Mm, um, that would um, be fun. I, not but really. not good for a podcast. No. I have been good at that game in the times past. Ooh, that one. No, that one. Oh, damn it. Oh, no, I think, I think thrilling I, audio. I think I completed the smallest Minesweeper thing in like three seconds at one point. Oh, that's Three good. whole seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, the look that's happening right now. It's pretty impressive. Uh, who can guess what country has the most landmines? Uh, what country has the most landmines, like in storage, like waiting to be planted? Or are we talking about in the ground landmines? I'm going to say in the ground, unexploded. U- UXOs. Uh, Vietnam, which uh-huh. is going to kind of cover two countries, sort mm-hmm. of, but uh, that's that's uh, my guess, Vietnam. That's not a bad guess, um, but I'm going to go with, it's got to be an African country. It could be that too, yeah. Uh, There's so many places it could be. I'm going to go with Rwanda. No, you're both wrong. Okay. okay. But let's start with Cambodia. Okay. okay. Cambodia has 8 to 10 million wow. right. landmines. Okay. Uh, laid by the Khmer Rouge. Right. Oh, yeah. The Heng Samrin and the Hun Sen regimes. The Vietnamese, the KPNLF, whatever that is, and the Sihanoukists. Bunch of okay. people. Bunch yep. of people. In most well, cases. Factions. In most cases, even the soldiers who planted the mines did not record where they were placed. Of course not. Uh, now, Cambodia has one of the highest rates of physical disability of any country of the world. More than 40,000 Cambodians have suffered amputations as a result of mine injuries since 1979. Got it. That represents an average of nearly 40 victims a week for a period of 20 years. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. While it is believed that no military groups are still deploying mines there, the devices are still being used in new and horrible ways. Oh, great. Civilians have used mines to protect property and settle disputes. Oh, good. Well, you like throw a mine at a guy's head? I think so. It's like you go discus style yeah. on it. It's like, uh, oh, here, here, I'm, I'm practicing for the Olympics. Take that! Or you lure people into it. I dare you to cross this line. Kaboom. Ha yeah. <laughs> ha, sucker. <laughs> Poachers are reportedly using mines to hunt tigers, which are prized for use in medicine in neighboring Vietnam. Okay. <sighs> the, the, but, you know, if you blow your tiger up with a landmine, <laughs> aren't you risking. That all the valuable things that you would get out of a tiger might be damaged. Yeah. I I think you just Honestly, get, I think you like take a chicken and say it's tiger bile or whatever. Yeah, yeah. there you go. It's got chicken as much. gizzards. Yeah. How'd you get the tiger bile? We set some landmines. Uh, and in one incident in 1998, police surrounded a forest with mines in order to capture a murder suspect who had hidden there. He emerged from the forest, stepped on a mine, and was then shot to death by police. Like, did the mine go off, or it was one of those stepped on the mine, couldn't move, and they went, excellent. No, bang, I, bang, think bang, it's, bang. I think he stepped on the mine, destroyed his leg, Yeah, and then they shot him. Oh, fantastic. Don't so, let him get away. Didn't you say earlier in this story that they set mines to apprehend this person? Well, they apprehended his corpse. Their definition of apprehend is different than ours, I think. <laughs> Quick, throw that body into jail. <laughs> yeah. At the current rate of progress, it may take as many as 100 years to clear all the mines in oh, Cambodia. Wow. So now we play more or less. Okay. okay. The next country is Angola. More or less mines than in Cambodia, which was, as we said, 8 to 10 million. I know so little about Angola. Uh, I'm going to go with more. I'm going to say less. More. Okay. All right. 10 to 20 oh, million. I, I shouldn't be that happy about that. <laughs> yeah, yay! <laughs> yay! I should like, tone down my, uh, my, my joy at, at victory. 10 to 20 million, which equates to at least one to two landmines for every person in the country. Oh, so so here, you know, uh, every couple has uh, 1.7 kids. Mm-hmm. There, every individual has 2.0 landmines. That's right. That's it's right. like, you know, you gauge your uh, your success by like, I got the house with the white picket fence and the 1.7 kids and the two cars and like, we're good to go. I've got my hut and my two landmines and my uh, Angola sweaters. Angola sweater? Yeah, yes. That's right. And that's how you gauge your success in Angola. Okay. Oh. Bosnia, Herzegovina. Uh huh. Herzegovina. Herzegovina. Mm-hmm. Yes, it does. Mm-hmm. More or less than Angola? Uh, I think I see a trend here. I'm going to go more. I'm going to say less. Only less. 3 million. Yes. Ah, oh, boom. And I can celebrate the 3 million. Yeah. Uh, 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 Bosnia Herzegovina is heavily contaminated with landmines and explosive remnants of war, primarily as a result of the 1992 to 95 conflict mm-hmm. right, related to the breakup of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Mm-hmm. Mines were used extensively along confrontation lines, which moved frequently. Most minefields are in a zone of separation between the two entities. This 1,000 kilometer long and up to four kilometers wide. Right, mines were used randomly, often with little record keeping. Every month. Landmines kill or injure 30 to 35 people 
eighty percent of them civilians. Right. So one a day. The presence of these deadly weapons is hindering reconstruction, severely reducing food production, and diverting resources yeah. needed to rebuild society. Right, of course, because nobody wants to dig in a minefield. Yeah. Bosnia-Herzegovina has the highest number of landmines per square mile of any country. Right. Got yeah. it, because it's a very small country. 152. Got it. Per square mile. Per square mile. That's the average. Uh, over the whole country. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of man landmines. Wow. Yeah. Wow. More or less, Egypt. Less. Oh, wait, then Bosnia? Yeah. Less. Do they have a, maybe they have a whole bunch along the border, though? Uh, I'll say less. More. Oh. Ah. Number one in the world. Oh, oh Egypt. 23 million. Wow. Wow. Why but is it that? It was like a dictatorship for so long. Like, you expect those things to happen, like, it's... in countries where there's, like, longstanding conflict, like so, Bosnia and Cambodia. Well, I'm going to guess it's probably along the Israeli-Egypt border, right? Uh, but there is no border. It's to or, get the Suez Canal the, the way. Well, I mean there, right? Right. At that edge. Okay. World War II oh. and the oh. Egypt-Israel Wars of 1956, mm-hmm. 1967, and 1973 yeah. have left Egypt a mine-affected country. Egypt's problem stems from the fact that its landmines are old and hard to locate and were designed for use against tanks, whereas international criticism is generally focused on anti-personnel mines. Mm-hmm. Right. So they don't get any sympathy because they're tank mines, not people mines. Seven million mines have been cleared from the Western Desert in the past 15 years and three million from the Sinai Desert. Mm-hmm. The nomadic people refer to waste tracts of desert minefields as the Devil's Garden. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah, sounds about right. You plant them, you know, yes, and, then and you they grow. grow. You grow some death. Yeah. Also on the list, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan both had 10 million. Iran, 16 million. And uh-huh. Croatia, 3 million. Wow. Same as uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. Mm-hmm. Wow. I've got some some mine science here. All right. Mm. Okay. Landmines cost between $3 and $30, but the cost of removing them is $300 to $1,000. Right. So as I kind of did in my head there. I wonder what, like, the two manufacturers of the $3 and the $30 landmine, like, you know, when you go to your landmine store. Right. Right? And they've got, you know, mm-hmm. you, when you go to Home Depot or whatever, you know, yeah. you have, like, a, a $3 set of pliers and you got a $15 set of pliers and mm-hmm. there's... You know, obviously, some sort of like your three dollar to your thirty dollar. What, what's, what's the difference? Between well, let's say your budget land. is a hundred dollars. Yep. Okay. You can get the three dollar. You can get thirty thirty three dollar mines. Yep, that's right. Or you can get three thirty dollar mines. mines. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a no brainer. I'm going for the three dollar mines every time. Right. But like, what don't the three dollar mines give you that the thirty dollar mines probably do? reliability. So Ooh. you're going to just spread out. You're going to you're probably going to put those thirty in the same minefield and hope that some of them go off, and you're just going to cause more problems for all the children that want to play there twenty years later. No, I know what it is. The thirty dollar landmine doubles as a Roomba. Oh, there you go. Ooh, right. nice. Yeah, so also like cleans the house. You could use Roombas to clear landmines, maybe. Mm, maybe. Get another one. Mm-hmm. Mines kill or maim more than five thousand people annually. Mm. One D miner is killed and two injured for every five thousand successfully removed mines. Okay, that's not mm. too bad. So it's, mm. Yeah, except there's 110 million of them, so you need oh, a shit. lot of mine sweeping <laughs> dudes and gals. Oh yeah, so how many lives? Hold on, 110 million. Let's do 110 okay. million divided by five thousand. One ten. Uh, how many people do we need? So twenty-two thousand people. Twenty-two thousand deaths is what it's going to take to clear if we the do it landmines. that way to, kill, to get rid of all the landmines in the world. An That's entire right. small town of of lives given that up is... just for the people demining. Yeah, it's a noble effort. We'll just That's get it. the old and infirm to do it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> There you go. Wait, we're going to be old and infirm soon. Wait, Fuck hold that. On. Yeah, right. That means okay. that. But here's the thing: these are these are very good D miners, and they get killed every five thousand mines. Somebody with a really shaky hand. No, you know what you need. Oh, no. You need 110 million old and infirm people. Yeah, maybe because they're probably not going to get more than past the first or second mine oh, no. before they get completely. Can we just get 210 rats? That'd be better. Yeah, yeah. No, but the rats. The reason that the rats are great is they don't they don't they don't weigh enough to like set the mines. Off. We're gonna make a heavy rats. We're gonna we're gonna start <laughs> people child heavy size rats. metallic rats. Wait, hold on. What, what are those? Uh, those those um, capybaras. capybaras. Cap- yeah, yeah, they're capybaras. the largest rats. Uh, the most God. common injury associated with landmines is loss of one or more limbs. In the United States, the rate of amputations is one for every twenty-two thousand people. Mm. In Angola, it is one for every three hundred and thirty. Bam! Wow. 
In many of the most affected areas of the world, agriculture is the mainstay of the economy. Mm -hmm. Landmines are planted in fields, forests, around wells, water sources, and hydroelectric installations, making these unusable or usable only at great risk. Right. Both Afghanistan and Cambodia could double their agricultural production if landmines were eliminated. Mm. Yeah, right. uh, absolutely. Yeah, brutal. Some types of modern landmines are designed to self-destruct or chemically render themselves inert after a period of weeks or months. To reduce the likelihood of friendly casualties during the conflict or civilian casualties after the conflict's end. Mm -hmm. Okay, the I hope those are, are reliable. The Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons requires... Ooh, the Convention Convention. The Convention on Certain Conventional. Oh, okay. The sorry. Conventional Convention. Okay. Uh, requires that any personnel landmines deactivate and self-destruct and set standards for both. Okay. This seems like kind of a, uh, oh, we're not going to get what we really want, so let's yeah. compromise Nobody's thing. ever going to Nobody's ever going like, to stop yeah. using landmines altogether. So let's just get them to agree to use self-limiting And I ones. think right. by nobody they mean America. Uh, right? Well, well, and the Bosnians and Croatians yeah. and... So, uh, everybody. Uh, well, but I mean, like, Cambodians they could, they could and... probably tell those other people, here's the rule, stop doing it. But America's like, well, we're not going to do that. So they're like, well, how about this then? And I America's also like, think okay. there's probably some warlord in Angola who doesn't sure. give a shit about the conventional convention. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, landmines currently used by the U.S. military are designed to self-destruct between four hours and 15 days, depending oh. on the type. Hmm. Four hours self-destruct, like yeah, not explode. They just become chemically inert. Yeah, well, that means some. No, some of them. Do, some of them explode. Oh, do they? Because deactivation and self-destruction are two different things. Okay. Oh, there you go. There you go. The landmines have a battery. When the battery dies, the landmine self-destructs. Kablooey. The self-destruct system never failed in over 67,000 tested landmines in a variety of conditions. Most landmines that have been laid throughout history are not equipped to self-destruct, right. of course. Mm -hmm. Landmines can also be designed to self-deactivate, yep. for instance, by a battery running out of a charge, but deactivation is considered a different mechanism from self-destruction. Well, because you could technically accidentally get charged from somewhere else. Like, yeah. I mean, this is crazy, but, but like, the, like a lightning strike or whatever, yeah. But I mean, now you've just got mines like going off, yes. right? Like all over yeah. the place. Yeah, everybody's just standing there, tick, 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 ding, <laughs> So it seems like a scene out of V for Vendetta, you know, some sort of you know classical bombastic song going off. Uh, <laughs> Let's talk about naval mines. No belly right. button. Maritime mine warfare was first introduced in the Ming Dynasty, China, okay. in the 14th century. Oh wait, the Ming Dynasty or the Mine Dynasty? The Ming oh. Dynasty, and was there used. Ming mines. Used against Japanese pirates in the 16th century. Okay. Sea mines, like their land-based cousins, could serve as more of a deterrent than a direct weapon. Enemy ships had to sail around known minefields. Thus, a force could mine waters on the most direct route between an enemy base and their own waterways. Mm -hmm. Such a tactic was used during World War I to try and limit the effectiveness of German U-boats by forcing them to take a longer route to get at Allied shipping with the North Sea Mine Barrage. North Sea Mine Barrage. Got it. There's a famous saying from the Gulf War that you do not actually need any mines to create a minefield. You just need a press release and a notice to mariners. Oh, wow. Um. <laughs> yeah. We have mined here. Don't go there. Yeah. Crap. Yeah, yeah. And of course, what are you going to do? You could be like, it's total bullshit, man. Oh, there's only faking it. Let's risk There's only faking it. Let's just go right through there. No, of course. No one would ever do that. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like some, some crazy next level psychological warfare yep. shit. So you got your influence mines, which we touched mm -hmm. on in the right. in the pop culture. The influenza mines. The, yes, the influenza mines. Okay, you get, you get, when you get close to them, you get hot and sweaty. Then you got your contact mines. Yep. These are the earliest used. They're the ones you put in your eyes. The con yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> contact mines need to be touched <laughs> by the target before they detonate. Yep. Limiting the damage to the direct effects of the explosion and usually affecting only the vessel that triggers them. Yeah. Contact mines have the Hertz horn. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, which was found to work reliable even after the mine had been in the sea for several years. Oh, good. good done. During the initial period of World War One, the British Navy used contact mines in the English Channel and later in large areas of the North Sea to hinder patrols by German submarines. Later, the American antenna mine was widely used because submarines could be at any depth from the surface to the seabed. Right. This type of mine had a copper wire attached to a buoy that floated above the explosive charge, which was weighted to the seabed with a steel cable. Right. If a submarine steel hull touched the copper wire, the slight voltage change caused by contact between two dissimilar metals was amplified and detonated the explosive. Right. Mm -hmm. Got it. 
So you got your moored naval mine, right? Yep, which that's is the a, one that's like chained to the floor. Yep, so right? it doesn't drift away. But yep. then you also have your drifting mines, mm. occasionally used during World War One or World War Two. Uh, however, they are more feared than effective. Yeah. Right. Sometimes floating mines break from their moorings and become drifting mines. Okay. Modern mines are designed to deactivate in this event. After several years at sea, the deactivation mechanism might not function as intended and the mines may remain alive. Right. Mm. And then you have your bottom contact mine. Okay. This is merely an explosive charge with some sort of fuse fitted lying on the sea floor. Right. They have been used against submarines, as submarines sometimes lie on the seafloor to reduce their acoustic signature. Okay. Mm. They are also used to prevent landing craft from reaching the shore and were a major obstacle during the D-Day landings. The Germans used anti-tank mines here with minor modifications to make them more reliable underwater. So just repurposed anti-tank mines. So recycling. Yeah. Reduce, reuse, recycle, Got it. re-explode. Ah. Homing mines. A Russian invention, the rocket mine is a bottom-distance mine that fires a homing high-speed rocket, not a torpedo, Got it. upwards toward the target. And then you get your torpedo mine, a self-propelled variety able to lie in wait for a target and then pursue it. Some are capable of traveling as far as 10 miles through or into a channel, okay. harbor, shallow water area, and other zones, which would normally be inaccessible to craft laying the mines. Right. Mm-hmm. After reaching the target area, they sink to the seabed and act like conventional laid influence mines. Hmm. Then you got your daisy chained mine. Oh snap! This has something to do with the Duke's Hazard. This comprises. Oh, of... this is when you kidnap uh, Catherine Bach. Catherine Bach. She played Daisy Duke on Duke's oh, Hazard. Oh, okay. Thank when you. When you kidnap her and leave her in your basement, and then she's just daisy chained. She's, she's daisy chained. Mine. Yeah. Uh, so this is two moored floating contact mines, which are tethered together by a length of steel cable or chain. Okay. Typically, each mine is situated approximately eighteen meters away from its neighbor. And each floats a few meters below the surface of the ocean. Got it. When the target ship hits the steel cable, the mines on either side are drawn down the side of the ship's hull. Right. Exploding on contact. Kind of like a bolus. Yes. Oh, like yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. like, I like this. You hit the... the Go in the middle. And it goes... And they both come and they... Mm-hmm. Oh, they like hit both sides at the same time. More yeah, or less, yeah. Ooh, so it's a double whammy. Double. Literally a double, double whammy. whammy. Yeah. Uh, in this manner, it is almost impossible for target ships to pass safely between two individually moored mines. Mm-hmm. And then you got your dummy mine. Duh, this is a plastic mine drum. Is so stupid. Yeah, that one drives me crazy. Plastic drum filled with sand or concrete, periodically rolled off the side of ships as real mines are laid in large minefields. These inexpensive false targets uh, are designed to be of a similar shape and size as genuine mines and are intended to slow down the process of mine clearance. Yeah. So, Great. The problem Wait, of mine clearance. how many clearance. of those yeah. are there to clear on top of the 110 yeah. million the mines. mines? I like how it was called the problem mm-hmm. of mine clearance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, yeah. 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 Although well, everyone process. agrees that it should be, you know, easier and uh, not as uh, as hard on our 22,000 well, you want and them to firm be, and elderly. You want them to be super difficult, like, during that conflict when you put them down. Right. And then you'd like them to just go away. Mm-hmm. But nobody cares about that part when the super important being good part mm-hmm. is being done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's naval mines. Okay. okay. All right. Now we'll talk about landmines. I'm guessing this is going to be the biggest section. While more than 350 varieties of landmines exist, they can be broken into two categories, mm-hmm. anti-personnel mines yep. and anti-tank mines. Okay. Or AT right. mines. Mm-hmm. One would work for both, maybe? No. No. Like, you don't want an anti-tank mine to go off when a guy steps on it because you want it to stay there for a tank. Right. So you, and then mm-hmm. the, and vice versa as well. Well, the anti-personnel really, mine would anti-personnel mine's not going to hurt a tank, a tank yeah. so okay. I, probably right. not. That's probably distinct. Anti-tank mines are typically larger and contain several times more explosive material than anti-personnel mines. Got it. But they're designed to require more pressure to detonate than a human's weight. Of course. So it's easier to demine an AT mine All right. than mm-hmm. an AP mine. Got mm-hmm. it. AT mines are found on roads, bridges, and large clearances where tanks may travel. Yeah, when they have to, they're in a constrained area, so you know where to put the mines, right? Mm-hmm. Now, the conventional anti-personnel mines, okay. there are five types. Blast mines, okay. fragmentation mines, Got it. Mm-hmm. bounding fragmentation mines. Yep. Bounding fragmentation. Yeah. We'll I don't get, know what that means. We'll get oh, to that in a second. Yeah. Okay. Ugly. Directional fragmentation mines. Okay. And scatterable mines. <laughs> 
Gad to Rob- Oh, it's, that one's got to do Sowing with poop. Like seeds. No, just... that, that one's got to do with poop, right? Yes, poop mines. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, your dog lays them all the time, Joe. He really he does. It's okay. He, once they dry out, he goes and eats them. Oh, uh, good. He's go. his own minesweeper. He's disgusting. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a clean sweep, if you will. Yeah. Boop, 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 I don't know boop. if it's clean, though. <laughs> it's a dirty sweep. Mm-hmm. So blast mines of the more than 700 types of known anti-personnel mines, the okay. most common is the blast mine. Got it. Blast mines are buried no deeper than a few centimeters and are generally triggered by someone stepping on the pressure plate, applying about 5 to 16 kilograms of pressure. Okay. These mines are designed to destroy an object in close proximity, such as a person's foot or leg. A blast mine typically injures only the person who steps on it. Hmm. One type of explosive blast effect AP mine is the butterfly mine. Oh, that sounds pretty. Common, fa- Commonly found in Afghanistan. All right. Okay. Is it because it, uh, it flies away when you step on it? No. They, uh, they, it's, it's, it's very it's very pretty colored? It is pretty colored. Oh, really? And it has kind of a butterfly shape. Okay. A little bit, kind All of, right. sort of. Uh-huh. And so this is irresistible to children. Oh, of course, because that's your intended target. Yeah. We have a picture of all of these mines on CausticSodaPodcast.com. It has a butterfly shape to it. It looks kind of like a toy, too. Your fragmentation mines are triggered by a trip wire that is positioned only slightly above the ground, Mm -hmm. a couple centimeters, and can be placed together in groups tied to poles or trees, making a route extremely difficult to traverse. Mm -hmm. Right. Most shoot their fragments with a 60-degree horizontal arc and a two-meter vertical height and can kill up to 50 meters from the mine. So these explode out. These aren't just your yeah. fuck up Come your leg. Up and yes. you're dead. These no, are like no. fuck up everything. Shoots Within fragments 60 everywhere. meters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like it's a grenade that's like bigger and slightly raised up off the ground. Now, your directional fragmentation mine mm-hmm. uses a shaped charge which directs the explosive force in one direction. Okay. Yeah. The US M18 Claymore mine, which contains 70 700 steel balls and is lethal at ranges of up to 50 meters, Ooh. has the helpful legend, this side toward enemy, molded into the business end. Yeah. Wow, nice. These mines are usually triggered by tripwires and are often used in ambush situations. Well, yeah. you don't, you definitely don't want to put the wrong end pointing towards enemy. No. It is definitely a creative choice to stencil it in such a way. My mine laying is an artistic endeavor and I don't follow the traditional rules. <laughs> Got it. Scatterable mines are dropped from helicopters or dispersed from submunitions dispensers by cruise missiles, artillery, or bombs. Yep. They typically have a small explosive charge and by their nature lie on the surface, but the shock proofing that allows them to be scattered from the air renders them immune to most form of explosive triggering. These mines are often used for area denial. For example, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to close an enemy airfield, a helicopter will drop hundreds of mines which explode randomly over the next three days... To prevent mm-hmm. workers from patching the craters. So they're on like timers or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yep. And then they just like, okay. They don't explode when you touch them, when you pick them up, or when you step on them. They just sit there and randomly go off, and yep. then there's thousands of them all over the air. Do they all like, do they, do they like, good question. Like real 60 minute style? That would like, like an egg timer, right? Support us on patreon.com slash caustic soda, and if we get enough money, we'll send Kevin into a minefield. Got it. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, the majority of scatterable mines do not self-destruct and must be cleared one by one. But at least they're like right on the on the ground. Or, yeah, you, you know, don't have to dig for them. Don't yeah. have to keep looking. Just get a snowblower unless you got the tall grass. Mm-hmm. Just get a big adamantium snowblower. Adamantium <laughs> snowblower. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So you're bounding fragmentation mines. Got it. And now that I speak of adamantium, why are there no superheroes dealing any doing anything about this? Like well, 100, landmines? 110 million landmines. Bet you Superman could deal with those pretty darn quick. There was a Batman comic yeah. about landmines. Oh, wow. Maybe right. I should wait for pop culture. Okay. There you go. So the bounding fragmentation mines Got leap it. into the air once triggered by a tripwire. Yeah. I have seen this in, uh, in movies before. Mm-hmm. Colloquially known as the Bouncing Betty. Yeah. The German-invented S-mine is best known for its most deadly attri- attribute, bouncing. Yep. Buried under the surface of the ground like other landmines, the S-mine contains a pressure charge in the body of the explosive device, which propels the device upwards after the bic- victim moves off the mine. So this is the only mine where when you step on it, it doesn't go off. Right, right. Once you step off of it, yeah. it goes off. It, uh, it waits for you to release the pressure, so it's like so your foot gets loaded. Yeah. You can jump up, yeah. The pressure and getting in all the uh, sensitive areas, the more squishy parts, as <laughs> yes. opposed to like your feet and legs. Yeah. Well, and also cover a much wider area. Right? Yeah. The pressure change from stepping off the mine causes the explosion to be at mid-body level to the victim mm-hmm. instead of at ground level. 
The weight required to activate the S mine was about was above 15 pounds of pressure. This ensured only large animals and humans would be activating these explosives and not accidentally detonated by small wildlife in the area Got before it. enemy combatants could arrive. Right. This device was used throughout World War II by German forces in Europe, but is often associated with its prolific use in the Vietnam conflicts. Wow. Uh, and Kelly... N, one of our researchers, Got it. Uh, who prepared this section, says, My father served in Vietnam and had watched someone step onto a bouncing Betty. As soon as the pressure plate is engaged, a click sound can be heard. Thankfully, this was in the middle of a dry day and not in a hot zone. Mm-hmm. He told me some engineers were able to deactivate the device and the other soldier was rescued. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Click. So we actually did have that standing yeah. on a mine. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the uh, the old if Hollywood has taught me anything, you have to be a big star to survive that scenario. Yes, yeah, <laughs> that's right. You have to be, you know, Michael J. Fox or Matt Damon or whoever, right? Everybody else just looks scared, and then there's an explosion. Yes, yeah. Oh no, or the classic: you you do your best to get them off the mine, and you fail. Mm, yep. So then it gives you cause for revenge. Public, Public service announcement. announcement! So you've stepped on a mine. <laughs> what know. to expect uh, the from a blast worst, or frag mine? Worst reality show sequel to So You Think You Could Dance yet conceived. So this is from Ben McBean, Afghanistan 2008. Okay. We were sent to clear a compound, an old Afghani house, to check there were no Taliban or mines there. We were running across a football pitch-sized area from mm-hmm. our vehicle towards the doorway, yep. and when we were halfway across, there was this bang. Not even a boom. My ears didn't even pop. I closed my eyes, and when I opened them again, I was upside down and falling backwards toward the ground. I oh, must wow. have been blown about 20 feet high. Whoa. So he closed his eyes, and he was still in the air. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. Oh, crazy. Mm. I landed on the floor. I went to sit up and saw my whole shin bone sticking out with no foot at the end of oh, my right leg. Oh, good. I like my feet and shin bones. <laughs> Do you? I do. I like them still attached to my body. Yeah, <laughs> kind of a fan of that too. Oh, jeez. Although this right one, kind of the right foot, is kind of a pain in my ass. <laughs> well, you know what though? You should stop that weird yoga you do. Then only oh. <laughs> if you're shoving it up there. That is not where it's supposed to go during yoga. Cloud with silver lining scenario. You know, you only got to clip half the toenails. <laughs> that's, oh, that's right. right. Yeah. That's right. Even before- half the shoes, you get half price on all your shoes, right? <laughs> that's right. I only need the left one. Yeah, that's right. I want to pay half. Even before I saw it, I knew there'd been damage because I could feel one half was a lot lighter than the other when I sat up. Oh, yeah. That's a dead giveaway. (laughs) On my left leg, my knee was coming off. (gasps) One of my balls was hanging out of the sack. Wow. (laughs) It's uh, so telling that we all find that more distasteful than losing your foot and cracking your shin bone. The pain was horrendous. I can't even describe it. Kevin, you just have to go through it yourself. Uh, Again, uh, uh, patreon.com slash caustic soda. And uh, give us some money and we'll put Kevin through some pain. uh, I'm going to keep my sack inside or my ball inside my sack. And it's not just the pain. Obviously, I'd never seen the inside of my body before. (laughs) There was meat everywhere. Meat. Man meat. Yeah, I don't think I want to be in a situation where I can see the inside of my body. <laughs> no, I, that's, yeah, I get body horror out of that myself as well. Mm, my mind was telling me I was dead. I couldn't see further than my weapon because there was a massive dust cloud. Right. I was breathing heavily and half screaming, half mumbling. Yeah, well, crazy. Then I realized that my leg was not going to grow back nope. and my career was over. Right. Everything hit me in that one second. I wasn't ready for it. Mm-hmm. I started to crawl to where the other guys were, and that's when I noticed I had a hole in my forearm, and my left arm was pretty much wrapped around my neck. Oh, oh it's all shattered and stuff. When I squeezed it, it was all gooey, and I knew it was dead, too. <laughs> oh, wow. Gooey arm. Oh. Oh. One of the guys had a load of shrapnel in his back, and oh. some had it in his neck and face, but oh. I was the worst off. Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, oh. We sat there for 10, 15 minutes waiting for the helicopter to come, but it felt like 10 years at the time. Yeah, of course. In the helicopter, I didn't know whether I was going to live or die. Annoyingly, everyone was saying, you're fine, you're fine, you're going to make it. But I kept thinking, I'm not fine, seriously, I want to know what's going on. Yeah. Mm. I suppose it's better than someone saying, you're going to die in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, I guess. I mean, this is a lesser of two evils right here. Would you rather have somebody say, you're fine, you're totally fine, you're going to make it, and you know it's just like empty platitudes? Yeah. yeah. Or would you rather like, uh, 
Yeah. Here's the deal. Here's the. I'm giving it to you straight. I, you I would like the middle ground. I would like the. You're totally. F- I'm not going to lie. You're fucked up, but we're here, and we're going to do everything we can. Right? Because that's yeah. the truth. That's that's both the harsh truth oh. and the helpful. Please stop worrying. We're yeah, all here. I want to go you're, you're, you're fine. You look better than ever. Yeah. Oh yeah. Don't worry. This is all just a hallucination. <laughs> you know what? I, that's what I appreciate. I appreciate somebody getting uh, cracking some humor with it. Right? You know, like. <laughs> Hey, uh, it's an improvement for the guy who got it in the face and neck. Right. It's like, hey, it's a marked improvement. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, I would you kill that, that guy. You had the would... ugly mug before. In now you kind of like. In my head, just yeah. mark that guy's head, that guy's face down as the one who dies once I get my artificial yeah. limbs. Yeah. They sedated me in the helicopter. When I woke up pretty much on my 20th birthday, I was back in the UK. Oh, I should have been reading this with an English accent. I'm sorry. Mm. The hardest thing for me was the fact I was going to be like this forever. I've spent a lot of time reminiscing. It's only in the last six or seven months that I've stopped going on about it, wishing all the time I had two arms and two legs. And I've got a photo here. Put this up on causticsodapodcast.com. There he is. uh, Thumbs up. Yeah. Uh, Both legs gone. Left arm mostly gone. Thumbs up Mm. with the right arm. Wow. One out of four ain't bad. I I think he's got his left leg. It's it got a, oh, is that a bit of his leg? Maybe. I can't really yeah, tell hard, if it's chopped it off it's there hard. or not. Yeah. yeah. No, it appears it appears that it's... Uh, that is weird, though, that you would lose left arm and right leg. I, well, you go yeah. flying in the air and other shrapnels going yeah, and things hitting so. you and randomness. And now, what were they doing there again? Uh, they, they were, were just clearing checking. an Afghani house. They were checking a compound. Okay. All right. Hoping that there were no Taliban or mines there. Oops, mm-hmm. there were. Mm-hmm. It took him eight or nine weeks to get walking again. Okay. All right, that's not so bad. That's a, in the grand scheme, that seems like actually a reasonable amount of time. I used to have dreams about the incident. I used to smell a really bad smell like burning flesh. Mm-hmm. Right. Sometimes when I've sat on my own for too long, I've thought about the moment when it happened, and I've almost made myself sick. So I try to keep myself busy and not think about it. Got it. But I don't feel angry. Anyone can stand on a bomb. It just so happened to be me. So he seems like he's uh, found some like uh, zen balance on yeah. all this right. thing. Now, we talked about the conventional mines. Mm-hmm. Yep. Here's some unconventional mines. Such as the laundry mine. You step on it, and a whole bunch of dirty laundry goes over and goes, ha, now you got to clean it. Yeah, yeah, there you go. It's very it's unconventional. Chemical mines. There are many varieties of chemical mines, and the manner in which they are activated varies. Uh-huh. Uh, the Russian KHF-1 and KHF-2 are mines uh, activated by someone several hundred meters away. These oh, mines wow. can spread chemical gases up to about 300 square meters. But how do you set it off if it goes off when you're like yeah, 100 meters away? Remotely. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Yep. Mm-hmm. However, there are some American varieties. Yep. The M23 chemical mine that once activated will spread VX nerve agent. Oh, oh, wow. Extremely potent toxin with as little as 10 milligrams being enough to kill a human being. It was outlawed in 1993 right. under the Chemical Weapons Convention. Mm-hmm. Causes uh, nausea, vomiting, muscle spasms. Okay, so it's not still in use. No, hopefully. Uh, Maybe it, somewhere. It, it might be somewhere. Following these initial effects, the victim loses control of their bodily functions, suffer blistering of the lungs and eyes, and eventually respiratory failure. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got the Bulgarian anti-helicopter mine. The Bulgarian I, anti-helicopter mine. Yeah. Is this like a flying drone that just stays up in the air hovering until a helicopter comes by? Well, we got a picture. All right, let's okay. check it out. We'll put this up on com, obviously, so go check it, it out. It sits on the ground. Oh, it looks like a spotlight. It's capable of sensing a nearby approaching helicopter via the use of an acoustic sensor. All right. Mm-hmm. It also has a radar sensor. Mm-hmm. It's capable of projecting fragments up to 200 meters in the air. Okay, that's a that's a long ways. The Helcure mine is another anti-helicopter mine that mm-hmm. similarly uses an acoustic sensor to detect enemy aircraft. So it's when you hear it like the wop 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 or or maybe maybe it just listens for flight of the valkyries. Turn that off. They got mines for that now. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Mm-hmm. But then this enables the IR sensor which is infrared uh, sensor which is capable of sensing heat generated okay. from the engine got it. at which point the mine blasts fragments that can penetrate metal of the helicopter. Got mm-hmm. it. There are also anti-handling mines. Detonated if someone attempts to lift, shift, or disarm the mine. Oh, okay. The intention mm. is to hinder D miners by discouraging any attempts to clear minefields. See, this is where the you know feeble-minded Alzheimer's uh, aged patients come in because it's designed to take out the guys who are capable of taking out five thousand. So, oh, right. So okay. Send yeah. in the people who occasionally forget who they are and where they are and what they're doing. <laughs> yes, precisely. <laughs> okay. 
Alternately, some mines may mimic a standard design, but actually be specifically intended to kill D miners. Yeah. For this reason, Oof. the standard render safe procedure for these types of mines is often to destroy them on site without attempting to lift them or else you risk injury yeah. and death. Yeah. Yeah. A fugaz, fugasse, fugasse, okay. F-O-U-G-A-S-S-E. This is an improvised mine constructed by making a hollow in the ground or a rock and filling it with explosives and projectiles. Mm. Common projections include stone, mortar shells, and later flame, flammable liquids. Okay. The original method of firing was to use a burning torch a slow or slow match to ignite the cloth or leather tube filled with the explosives that lead to the main charge. Okay. In 1573, Samuel Zimmerman devised an improved method to fire this improvised landmine right. using a wheel lock or flintlock firing mechanism to have the person firing the fugaz safely away from the device and an enemy. So this is like an ancient landmine. Yes. Okay. Also allowed the fugaz to be activated by tripwire. So kind of like a booby trap kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This uh, was used... Call back to our booby traps episode. This was used in World War II. Okay. They used 40-gallon drums full of a mixture of petrol and gas oil, later upgraded to an adhesive gel or tar. Got it. Lime and petrol mixture known as 5B. Mm-hmm. Placed at a location like a corner, steep incline, or roadblock where vehicles would slow down uh, when triggered, a propellant charge caused the weapon to shoot a flame 10 feet wide and 30 yards long. Wow. That's a pretty good flame. That's a good That's a good fireball. You know, that's a great ball of fire. That is a great mm-hmm. ball of fire. Goodness gracious. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. About that thing. Got it. In Russia, World War II, used an eight-gallon canister full of oil that melted the outer metal of tanks. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Crazy. A Soviet FOG static flamethrower destroyed four tanks and an entire company of submachine gunners, around 150 men, and caused the survivors to flee in panic. Wow, yeah. of course. Of course. Jesus. Yeah. It, it, it destroyed four tanks? Like with a flamethrower. entire company of 150 men? That is insane. And also used in the Korean War. Yeah, that sounds like a particularly horrible way to go. Hey, intrepid listeners. Uh, we want to engage you in a uh, tell-a-friend campaign. Tell a friend. Mm-hmm. Tell two friends. Tell all your friends to tune into Caustic Soda. We're trying to get our listenership up, and uh, uh, you guys are out there to help us. So encourage people to check it out. Especially tell your friends who are squeamish. Yeah, those ones especially. <laughs> Imagine how fun that will be for you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Think of it as a personal challenge. <laughs> See how many friends you can lose. Test your <laughs> test your friends with caustic soda, won't you? Britain had secret plans at the height of the Cold War to bury nuclear landmines in parts of Germany to thwart Soviet attack. Mm. Uh, the 10 proposed devices would have had the combined explosive power of more than five Nagasaki A-bombs, resulting in craters of more than 600 feet or 180 meters deep, and would have spread radioactive contamination across vast areas of the countryside if detonated. Mm-hmm. The weapons, codenamed Blue Peacock, because that's what everybody would have turned into had these things gone <laughs> off, uh, were to be left buried or submerged and detonated by a wire from up to three miles away or by an eight-day clockwork timer. I don't think three miles is far enough away from a nuclear device. Well, if it's ha- – so 10 with five Nagasaki, so it's half of a Nagasaki each. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the explosive mm. radius is. Oh, yeah. there's, there's websites so, you can do that can do overlays. Uh, that is also the worst version of the five days of Christmas. Ten Nagasakis. Mm. Five golden bombs. Eight clockwork timers. Seven <laughs> – Fugazes. They were also to be fitted with anti-handling devices, which right. meant that if gunfire pierced the hull or the weapon was moved or filled with water, it would detonate in 10 seconds. Oh. War Office specifications for a nuclear landmine first surfaced in 1954. A skillfully sighted atomic mine would not only destroy facilities and installations over a large area, but would deny occupation of the area to an enemy for an appreciable time due to contamination. Mm. Okay. Among suitable targets suggested were irrigation and hydroelectric systems, mm. industrial plants, oil refineries, railway junctions, and canals. Weighing in at more than seven tons, the size of the devices oh, meant that testing of the steel hull had to be done in public places, including at a flooded gravel pit oh. near Seven Oaks, Kent. Oh. 
In July 1957, the Army Council decided to order 10 of the mines and station them with forces in Germany. One hurdle was that the mines might not work in winter if they became too cold. Mm. So the Army proposed wrapping them in fiberglass pillows. The Cold War. Mm, how comfy. Fiberglass <laughs> pillows. Cozy <laughs> nuclear mine. By October, the design for Blue Peacock was nearly complete, but reservations were being voiced. You need, it like, you need like a cozy. Like a yeah. nuclear bomb cozy. Yeah, that's right. This yeah. like a seven-ton container. <laughs> Knitted by many grandmas. Yes, that's right. That's right. I, or, you know, you get the neoprene ones for your beers. Oh, yeah. But just <laughs> for you your go. nuclear devices. <laughs> Gave it nice and warm. Yep. Uh, the weapon was too large and heavy. The followed hazard was unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, Pre-positioning a nuclear weapon in an allied country was politically flawed. <laughs> and the weapon could not be stored in peacetime near to where it would be needed in war. Okay. In 1958, the Ministry of Weapons decided that work on Blue Peacock should cease. The only remaining prototype, minus any nuclear component, is now among the exhibits in the historical collection of the Atomic Weapons Establishment at West Berkshire. This reminds me of the nuke mine in Fallout 4. What's that? What, what is I that? Have uh, some, well, it, I does not, it is not a five Nagasaki radius. Five no. Nagasaki four. Then you would not be around. Four Fallout 4s. <laughs> Or follow video games. Yeah. Uh, oh, and I did find the nuke map so I could figure out how big the explosion on this should be given what we've been told. So yep. Nagasaki was 20 kilotons, so that means I'm going to guess each of these is about 10, and I've placed it over downtown Vancouver. Yep. Uh, it basically covers all of downtown Vancouver with a radiation radius of 1.25 kilometers. And okay. that's 500 rems radiation dose, uh, which is a between 50% and 90% mortality rates from acute effects alone without medical treatment. Right. And you will die uh, in several hours to several weeks. So you would be okay in Stanley Park. Stanley Park, if it was dropped straight in the middle of downtown Vancouver, yeah. Stanley mm -hmm. Park seems to be okay. You're fine. Eh. Oh, and the Kitsilano uh, is fine. And Science Center. My house is fine. Yeah. On commercial drive. Oh, yeah, look, Science oh, World. Oh, over here in Burnaby, we'd get a beautiful basking in the glow of the Ooh, it's probably it's January right now, so we'd probably warm up. Oh, that'd be so yeah. nice. Except the, for the millions the of old, deaths. The old heat wave. Camp Boniface. Oh. Golf course. Boniface. Oh, it's Boniface. Like, it's a uh, Skeletor's golf course. Bonif Boniface. Boniface mm -hmm. golf yeah. course. That's right. In South Korea okay. is a 192-yard par-3 difficulty golf course okay. on a South Korean military base. Oh, a golf course on a military base. Yeah. Mm. The hazard... South Koreans have a pretty sweet... I, don't... I was in the military. I do not remember any golf courses. Uh, the hazards for going out of bounds on this course are landmines. Ah, I see. Save for the entryway from the base, the entire golf course is surrounded by buried active landmines. Okay. Located in an area 400 meters south of the border between North and South Korea's demilitarized zone. Okay. The par 3 single hole golf course at the camp, which includes... Wait, par 3 single hole? <laughs> golf course, the, quotation yeah, the, marks. The, it's not a golf course. It's par 3. Like, it, single it's hole. Even, yeah. It's not yeah. a course at all. It's a golf <laughs> hole. <laughs> well, okay, okay, sure, fine. Uh, -huh. uh includes an astroturf green. Sports Illustrated called it the most dangerous hole in golf. Right, there Got you go. It. Okay. And there I are supposed to the most dangerous hole in the world, mm. which is uh one of, one of Joe's orifices. Oh, yeah. Joe. And there are reports that at least one shot exploded a landmine. There you go. Well, you That's need to like do extra if you can do that, isn't that worth even more than getting it in the little hole? If you can explode a landmine with a golf ball? Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Yes. Especially because they need quite a bit of pressure, right? Yeah. So you have to hit it pretty hard. You know, if you hit enough golf balls into that minefield, then uh, you can get another hole. Mm. Right. They should turn the minefield into the driving range, You know, switch the orientation, and just have it a driving range, just have people you know, slinging balls out into the minefield all day every day. Sure. And, you know, you might not need those mine-clearing rats. Clear those, clear the minefield. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Camp Boniface was home to the United Nations Command Security Battalion Joint Security Area, uh -huh. whose primary mission was to monitor and enforce the Armistice Agreement of 1953 between North and South Korea. Got it. Formerly known as Camp Kitty Hawk, it was renamed in 1986 in honor of U.S. Army Captain Arthur G. Boniface. Skeletor. Who, along with First Lieutenant Mark T. Barrett, posthumously promoted to captain, um, were killed by North Korean soldiers in the axe murder incident. Oh. Call back to our axes of evil episode. Oh, got okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So good golfing, everyone. 
And if you check out the Caustic Soda Smell episode, you will hear us talk about the Apopo, the uh, landmine-sniffing rats. Good times. Af- African poached rats. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. In the news. <laughs> Ding. 2009, Denmark. Mm. Research on the landmine-detecting flower has come to an end. Hmm. What? Landmine-detecting flower? Mm-hmm. The company behind the concept, Denmark-based Arisa, has discontinued work on the project. The company said the business model behind the landmine plant has become outdated, and consequently, Arisa is changing its strategy to investment in mine-contaminated land in Croatia. Oh, okay. Arisa intends to maintain its humanitarian focus, but now with a far less risky investment case for the stock. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> the genetically modified flower called Red Detect was oh. engineered to change color when its roots came into contact with nitrogen dioxide, a compound released by decaying chemicals used in explosives. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you'd plant these flowers and then, oh, they're red. Some would they're turn red colors, and so then you would know where the mines were. Interesting. But the Red Detect concept was not progressing toward commercial development as quickly as the company had hoped, and the growing use of mine clearance machines has driven down the cost and increased the machine's status as the preferred method for mine clearance. Right. Well, I imagine, like... Well, we they, have the, they have a big bag of plant. seeds, yeah. yeah, and they're like, all right, everybody, go and plant all these seeds in the minefield. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing they would <laughs> drop them, but yeah. It'd be funny if we did it my way. And, and also, you got to wait for them to actually, like, grow, whereas you could just take a minesweep machine and you can get your answer now. And that's why and rats. they're and that's not why. making those flowers. <laughs> yeah. Good idea, though. Yep. Good idea. Too bad it's Was not it a good idea? Profitable. Be like a good. Oh, it'd be like if you're a flower collector, that'd be like, oh, super Here's rare. Thing. Get the red mm. detect. If it was a good idea, mm-hmm. they would be using them. Mm-hmm. Pop culture? Well, I watched No Man's Land. It's uh-huh. in 2001. It is about a Bosnian and a Serb who are trapped in No Man's Land between two lines in the uh, Bosnian Serbian conflict. Yep. So it's these two guys, one is a Bosnian, one is a Serb. I'm not going to spoil much of the details because you should really try right. to track this down There's yourself. There's a mine involved somehow, no, The presumably. twist is there, no mines at all. Oh! The twist. What's really cool is they're not actually in a minefield exactly, but one there's a friend of the Bosnian who's been injured and is has is lying on top of a bouncing Betty mine. Oh, oh wow. okay. okay, there you go. And he's there with his friend, and then there's uh, an enemy soldier there with him, and there's a weird standoff between them, and both sides don't even know who's there. So it's this big setup, mm-hmm. and then it's how this gets dealt with, and it feels. Uh, I don't want to say exactly realistic, but what I mean is it seems to give a really good insight into how fucked up this whole Bosnian-Serb situation was. Right. Because okay. while they're going on with these really cool things going on, we, we've got to get out of here. We can't get out of here. Who's going to shoot us? Uh, what do we do about this mine thing and all the other stuff going on? You've got them like, who started the war? You started the war. You st-, Like they're right. constantly it's arguing like, about it. There's a, the uh, political uh, It's a microcosm of the- It uh, really is, yeah. Of the whole thing. Uh, and then, and the UN is there, and so when they find that they're they're there, I don't want again no spoilers, but like the UN has to come in and try and help these guys, but because of all the the red tape going on, and they're not allowed to do things, it, it's they call it a black comedy, yeah. which I think really means it's just it's got some funny bits. Right. Like they don't they they don't shy away from letting it's it a, kind of be humorous. It's a dramedy. Yeah, kind of. I a guess. camel. Like there's yes, no jokes. Exactly. It's a giant camel. It's not wow. that there's jokes. It's just that. The situations are a little ridiculous and funny sometimes. Okay, like what, you want to talk about happening? you want to talk about black comedy? That's I do. A good segue: uh, Tropic Thunder. Tropic Thunder. Oh, yeah. Tropic Thunder. When uh, Steve Coogan's character, the director of the film, uh, you know, drops out of the helicopter into the open field along with all the actors, and he's uh, you know trying to tell them that we're gonna you know shoot this method and we're gonna get yeah. this movie. You got to stay in character and all the rest of the stuff. And then five seconds after his big rousing speech, he is blown to pieces. <laughs> and of course, Ben Stiller, you know, believes it to be a ruse, you know, just to get them inspired and in the moment. So he right. picks up Steve Coogan's head and is like, you know, puts it on his hand and you know, like a <laughs> puppet. But it plays with it like a puppet. Uh, I think Tropic Thunder is, you know, one of the funniest movies uh, in the last like ten years. And uh, that scene. Was the, was the one where you saw it in the theater and you're like, whoa, like took you uh, completely by surprise. And, I think uh, you like it because you're in film. 
Uh, you oh, know, because it was that. about making film? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not there, in film, and I love Tropic Thunder. Maybe yeah. not as much as Star But there Star is a little bit of that. Does. Like, there are movies about yeah. making movies that only people who are in film like. <laughs> yeah. Like, Living in Oblivion with Steve Buscemi. That only film people like that movie. Yeah. Nobody who's not in film has any appreciation for that movie whatsoever. <laughs> but that movie doesn't have any landmines, so I'm going to, like, not talk about that at all. Galaxy Quest. Yeah. Has space mines in it. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Plays a major part in the uh, in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. They get set Magnetic up. Magnetic space mines. Set up as kind of a uh, Chekhov's gun early on. Oh, there's some space mines. We've got to get through them. It's tricky. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. later on. Yeah. Excellent. I love Galaxy Quest. Galaxy Quest is one of those movies when I went in and saw it, and I was really nervous that when I yeah. saw it in the theaters because I was like, this is, can this be good? I don't know if this is going to be good and be good. And I walked out of it going, that was pretty darn good it's like better and than a lot of star trek movies like and it's a parody of star trek yeah, yeah. yes yeah. precisely and then every time i watch it i think i just like it more because i well, just it's got a stellar enjoy cast. more, and more oh, stuff. It's stellar. great yeah. cast just like get it stellar stellar um, <laughs> it's got a galaxy cast just got a real <laughs> galaxy cast. Cosmic. <laughs> you've seen rambo the fourth rambo oh yeah yeah i actually really enjoyed the fourth rambo i'm like uh I actually went and saw it in the theater. I don't know why. Maybe I had a fever that day or something like that, because yeah, I normally weird. wouldn't go see a Have you seen movie. the first three? Uh, yeah. And uh, outside of First Blood, I think Rambo 4 is probably the best one. Ooh, interesting. Hmm. I think okay. it is the second best in the quadrilogy. What's the mine aspect? Well, it? so it's set in Burma, and of course you got like this military you know, junta, and you know all the locals are kind of at their beck and call, and... And Rambo just doesn't like to see people, you know, downtrodden, innocent people. Mm-hmm. And, of course, there's this, uh, this this scene where the army needs to get through this minefield. So how they uh, sweep for mines is they take all the locals and force them at gunpoint to walk across the open field. No, it's not even that. They throw the mines into the rice paddy and they bet on – they've oh. got a lineup of like six or ten peasants. Yeah. And they're like, all right, run across this – field that we've thrown mines into and whoever so purely for sport yeah how, purely for sport how much do you have to worry that just landmines themselves aren't evil enough that you have to make your villains of your movie yeah. just randomly decide to put it's already bad enough that there's mines there and you push people through but then yeah. you're going to add on we didn't even put them down for any reason but this right and then even if they don't step on a landmine which they the game's oh. not over until somebody steps on a landmine. And and then it's and then it was graphic. Oh, yeah. Like this Rambo movie turned up the notch on Absolutely. the gore. Like by a couple of factors that I was not anticipating at all. That whole last twenty minutes? Oh yeah. It was like digital blood everywhere. Oh yeah. They they went bonkers on the digital blood. And then there's another scene where Rambo sets a claymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, mine to go off when because he's being chased by the bad guys. Yep. and he sets it to go off right next to this big giant unexploded bomb. Oh yeah, yeah. And so it causes a, cre- a tremendous chain mushroom reaction. cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. there's several. There's a few mine scenes. Yeah, I, you know, I uh, I give it a a sort of sideways thumb up. Like uh, <laughs> you know, if uh, if you want to watch a dumb movie with lots of action and gore, yeah. you uh, can. Hardly go wrong with this effort. Like I said, my second in uh, second sure. favorite of uh, of the bunch. I watched this film called Landmine Goes Click from 2015. Yeah, oh I saw the trailer in anticipation of this, and the trailer looks pretty fantastic. Did the movie live up to the trailer? I thought the trailer didn't look fantastic. Really? Mm-hmm. And I, I thought the movie was also not fantastic. Oh, really? When okay. I read the synopsis, I was like, please let me find something else to watch. <laughs> uh-huh. the, the plot is trapped standing on an armed landmine. An American tourist is forced to watch helplessly while his girlfriend is terrorized and brutally assaulted. Right. It doesn't even begin. That, that, that is that is it's that's, it's a cursory treatment at best. So this American threesome take a hiking trip in Georgia, right? Georgia, Eastern European. East yeah, Europe. yeah, like a, a former Soviet state. The boyfriend of the lady, yeah, of this sets trio. up his best friend, right? His name is Chris, uh, to step on a landmine because the friend slept with his fiance. Oh, so it's like a complicated revenge plot at first. Yes. Mm-hmm. Got it. And then he leaves the two of them. You know, now that I've discovered your your cheating ways, this is my revenge, and now I'm taking it off. And so, we never see that guy again. This this is the worst the worst man in the world, this guy. Okay. So there's going to be spoilers from now on. Right. Okay. Okay. Because pe- last... people probably shouldn't watch this, I'm he, thinking. I, 
But it's a it's okay. a it's a it's a vengeful. It depends what you want to get out of it. Yeah, a, okay. You'll get the sense of what this movie is about by the time I finish this. Okay. okay, it's a it's a it's a it's a vengeful plot to get even with the two people that cheated on him. While the two that are left, and yes, you never see that evil boyfriend again. Right? Wow. The okay. The While the other two are trying to deal with this whole situation, a Georgian who kind of looks like a French IT guy. He, and he has a gun and a dog. He has a rifle and a dog. Okay. So he comes across the two of them and begins playing mind games with Mind them. games, not mind not games. Not mind games. Mind games, too. Okay. Mind games and mind games. Okay. All right. Uh, because they're completely under his control because he has the radio. He has- The rifle. The rifle. He's got- And he's got he's the dog. Got, he's got everything that they need to get out of this situation. Yeah. So he eventually rapes the girl. Oh, okay. While the forcing the other guy basically to watch. That's pretty awful. And so now he is their worst human being in the world. Okay. Okay. So it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a worst person off. Yes. So then in a, in a confusing edit, um, okay. the American dude accidentally shoots the girl in the head with the Georgian's gun, while the dog knocks him off the landmine, which is revealed to be a dud. Okay. And then and the American passes out. Okay. So that's like the first. Half so that feels like they couldn't figure out a way to finish movie. that. It yeah. feels like they're like, I don't know. Let's move yeah, on all this stuff happens at once. Okay. Right. And then we move to the second part of the movie. Okay. The, okay. the last half or whatever. All right. Well, now- There's we no s- landmine involved. There's no landmine involved. Okay. Okay. So now we see the Georgian living at home with his wife and his teenage daughter. Okay. So now this American, Chris, he shows up. The guy who's up. been standing on the landmine the whole time. Yeah. He shows up and he begins to psychologically torture and sexually assault and kill the daughter. Well, oh, after what? after he shoots the Georgian guy in the legs. Okay. So All now right. he's the hum- worst human being. In the yeah. World. All right. Okay. All and right. that's basically how the film ends. Okay. That's how the film ends. That's how the film ends. He he <laughs> shoots the girl. And so then these he... are filmmakers who think that this is a just revenge. I do not know what this movie is about. That's what that right. sounds like. And if so, they should never make film again. So, but what happened to the Georgian out in the field? Like, how did this guy get his rifle to shoot the girl with? He was. Just, he just left it lying out, out of reach of of Chris. Uh huh. But Chris had like a chain, and he did the old lasso thing and pulled the gun up towards him. So did the Georgian guy die in that storyline? No, no. In the first half, no, yeah. No, he shot the girl. The Georgian survived. He he. The guy on the landmine passed out. The first half of the movie ends yeah. with the guy on the landmine shooting the girl he cheated on his best friend with. Yeah, she's dead. He kills her. Yeah. And then he passes out. But what happened to the guy who brought the rifle? The Georgian? Yes. He just went home. After he raped the girl? Yeah. He raped the girl, said, all right, I'm out of here. Yeah. I, hope you, I hope you get blown was, up. Was he, he was there when he when the guy fired the gun, wasn't yes. he? Okay, so he saw the girl die. Yeah. yeah. And then that guy passed out, and the Georgian was like, all right, and went home. Is that what happened? Yep. Okay. Okay. And then the American tracked That's him the down. That's the problem you have? Tracked him down and has his own gun now, like a handgun with a silencer on it. Ah, uh, Okay. Well, wait a sec. Because he just decided to carry a handgun with a silencer in Georgia. I don't know where he got but it. He didn't have it before. Yeah, so, he didn't have it before. Uh, so you know, I, thought, I don't, and I don't know how much your, time has passed. From your description, it made me think that the American, that the the second half of the movie was actually a flashback. No, and that the American had killed this guy's daughter, and this guy had followed him and tracked him down. Flash forward. Flash forward. Flash forward. To the Georgian living his life after this whole event. Right. Mm-hmm. Don't know how much time has passed. Got mm-hmm. it. Chris shows up, ex- does this whole psychological and physical revenge. This does sound terrible. Was anybody but, redeeming? And, uh, and after it, I was with my friend and I said, Do you want to watch like an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants? Yeah. So just <laughs> like, like cleanse as a pal- our pal- cleanser? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. Got it. Because I was watching this movie and I would not, if I wasn't watching it for this podcast, I would have stopped. Oh, yeah. really? like, at what point? Pretty much right before the first rape scene. Okay. All right. Got it. And that rape scene went on way too long. Got it. Which means longer than a second. Uh, oh, but much, I much longer. I know what you're saying, but yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But the acting was fine. Okay. So, and Very I kind of wanted to see what would happen. Got it. Hoping, yeah. that's, hoping it would, that there would be some sort of payoff or right. something, yeah. that it might get better somehow. But it was just like, oh, I, these all these characters are terrible. Oh, they're even worse. Oh, they're even worse. Oh, they're even worse. Mm-hmm. It's a downward spiral. Yeah. The only not horrible people in the movie were the, the females. Uh, who were killed. Who were both murdered. Well, who were just victims, right? Who were victims, yeah. yeah. Got, got yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Do not recommend. Landmine goes Landmine click. Landmine goes click. 
I could tell that just from reading that synopsis. Like I said, I, could, I was like, I know if I watch that, I'm just going to feel dirty inside. It seems, well, you watched this trailer and you thought, oh. It's, well, I thought the good. setup was very interesting. The setup is interesting. Yeah. It devolves. That's, yeah. It starts It starts at its most interesting. Got it. It would have been better if he'd stepped on the landmine, he'd have gone off and killed everybody involved, and then movie over. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's such a weird feeling to know you're alive. It's such an awful feeling. You're dying inside, and when you wake up, startled to say, I hope I don't go crazy today. It's such a bad feeling, an ominous feeling, a feeling you know that we'll be back when the week is new. And we'll have more gross facts for you. And you'll have things you want to hear about. We will too. Caustic Soda was recorded by Mike Leeson while I slowly attached leeches to his body. To comment on episodes and for links, images, videos, and show notes, visit causticsodapodcast.com. Support us at patreon.com slash caustic soda. Rate and review us on iTunes. Visit us on Facebook. Tweet us on Twitter at Caustic Podcast. Email us at info at causticsodapodcast.com. I'm Gregory Milne. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Yeah. Conan? <clears throat>